Right, hi. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. So I'm going to be focusing in this talk on going through evidence and not going through rigorously a systematic review of the evidence, but I'm going through very selective evidence because it's stuff that I know well to try and come up with a clinical approach to how to deal with this common problem. A lot of the stuff I'm going to be presenting comes from our study of uh, a prospective cohort study of people with WHO danger signs and cough. Why did we choose that? Because that's the entry point for the WHO algorithm for diagnosing TB in inpatients. I also learned a lot from the study. Now I've been doing on and off TB and HIV diagnostic studies in inpatients and outpatients for quite a long time now, over 30 years. And when we did the study, I was able at last to have enough money to do everything we wanted to do. And I learned a lot from it. Lots of things that I thought I knew well from the bedside and from my own research turned out to be wrong. However, the study has limitations. It may not be generalizable to all inpatients. Not everyone has a danger sign, about just under, just over a half do. And, and then also we had some limitations. We couldn't get cultures because everyone had an antibiotic before we saw them. So we use quantitative PCR, which is pretty good, but the cutoffs aren't quite validated or certainly weren't when we, at the time when we did the study. So it's not the perfect study by any means, but I think the lessons I learned from it, I hope are generalizable. So let's kick off with pulmonary opportunistic infections. Why are they such a big deal? Well, they are the commonest reason for hospitalization amongst HIV positive people. If you get the diagnosis wrong, there's a good chance that the patient will die. There've been a lot of novel diagnostics in TB, notably expert and urine LAM, um, but a high percentage of people can't produce sputum. I'll return to this point a little bit later. And urine LAM is not very sensitive. So there can be quite a lot of people whose LAM is negative, who can't produce sputum, who do have TB and you're left scratching your head. Most patients will have one of the big three, TB, bacterial pneumonia, or pneumocystis. Sometimes I call it PCP, sometimes I call it PJP. Mostly I'm a PJP man, but here and there I use PCP. Co-infections occur commonly, which is a point I'm going to hammer home. And in our setting, in public sector hospitals, generally we're in the business of making empiric diagnoses for much of what we see. So just to start with a few cases of typical cases of the three big three that I've spoken about. 28 year old person with a short history of cough, right side of the chest pain, fever and rigors. It's tachypneic, oriented, and has focal signs at the right base. White cell count is elevated, normal hemoglobin. And there's a chest X-ray, which shows consolidation with air bronchograms in the right lower lobe, sparing the apical segment. So that's obviously a barn door typical case of bacterial pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia has increased 100 fold in HIV infection. And the risk, like most things, becomes exponentially higher as the CD4 count drops. The diagnosis is exactly the same as it is in HIV negative people. It's a clinical diagnosis, a short illness, and you see consolidation on the x-ray and the illness is consistent with pneumonia. The etiology is similar to what we would expect from community acquired pneumonia in people with comorbidity like diabetes or COPD, for instance. I've listed them here from the most common to the least common. Atypical bacteria seem to be very uncommon. And that was one of the findings in our studies. We had hardly any people with atypical bacteria. And there's controversy about the some studies have shown some, some studies have shown very little, but in our study, we saw very little. The second case is a 36 year old who'd interrupted ART, her CD4 count was 122 for three weeks, progressive shortness of breaths and a dry cough. Temperature 37.9, oxygen sats were down, tachypneic, oriented, normal hemoglobin, no focal chest signs, normal white cell count. And here you can see an X-ray showing largely a ground glass pacification bilaterally with some pneumatoceles. 
and this is obviously pneumocystis pneumonia. The definitive diagnosis is by lavage, where you can identify the fungi by uh, fluorescent stain or by silver stain, as is shown over here. Induced sputum is a very good way of diagnosing this. It's not quite as good as lavage, but it's very specific. Uh, so you pick up about, if it's done properly, you pick up about 80% of the people that you would pick up on a scope. PCR, unfortunately, can't distinguish between infection and colonization, but there's emerging evidence, it's been emerging for a long time, but people haven't decided what the cutoff is, that a quantitative PCR probably is the way forward, but we still don't have a reliable cutoff yet. A part of our study, we looked at this PCP question. We did use PCR as our diagnosis, which is not a great strength, but this is what we had. And what we found was very in keeping with what's out there in the literature. And there's not a huge amount out there in the literature about how to diagnose pneumocystis clinically, but there is a bit. So we looked at two clinical prediction models, which were very similar. The only difference was in the one model, we had respiratory rate because we figured that not everywhere would have access to a pulse oximeter. And in the other model, we replaced respiratory rate with oxygen saturation. And in clinical prediction rules, modeling, basically, this is just logistic regression done in a fairly sophisticated way, not by me, by people who really know. And the odds ratio here tells you in both scores that what the chest x-ray shows you is a very, very strong predictor that this is pneumocystis. So the chest x-ray is actually a lot more helpful than it is, for instance, in TB. If the person is not anemic, that favors pneumocystis. And if the respiratory rate for every 10 increase above the normal, that also doubles the chances of getting pneumocystis. Very similar finding with the oxygen saturation model. Here, if the saturation was less than 94%, there was a five-fold increased risk of TB. So if you've got a bilateral interstitial pattern and your oxygen sats are low, the chances are it's pneumocystis. That was, of course, pre-COVID. So <laughs> once your COVID test is negative, it's a very good chance that the person has got pneumocystis. That's the third case, 31-year-old man, newly diagnosed, nine weeks of typical TB symptoms, respiratory rates moderately elevated, a little bit confused, crackles and dullness in the left upper zone, HB is low, white cell count normal. Not uncommon for us to see features of bacterial sepsis in HIV positive people with TB, like in this patient. He has a chest x-ray showing asymmetrical but bilateral infiltrates, some areas of cavitation. And that was, of course, a case of TB. So let's start with how we screen for TB in our patients. In 2011, the WHO came out with a four symptom screen uh, for outpatients, which is cough, current cough of any duration, fever, night sweats, or weight loss. Any of those four, you have flagged someone as a TB suspect and you should work them up for TB. But when they dreamt that up, they didn't really think about anything other than outpatients and they assumed that it would apply equally to all types of TB, but actually it turns out that it doesn't. We conducted for the WHO a new individual participant data meta-analysis, which is basically the same as a meta-analysis, except instead of looking at summary data, we got the raw data from the original studies and then did a, a re-meta-analysis. So it's a more accurate way of getting to the evidence. And the sensitivity of the WHO symptom screen is brilliant at 96%, but specificity is awful at 11%. There's another study that Steve Lorne, the late Steve Lorne, did at a secondary hospital in Cape Town. It was an unselected, anyone was HIV positive, they weren't on TB therapy, they got into the study. And you can see in the table here, if there was no TB, the WHO symptom screen was positive in about 90%. When there was TB, it was positive in 97%. Yes, that's statistically significant. But as a clinician, how helpful is it to say you've moved from 90% to 
I don't think that's very helpful. What about the chest X-ray? Now, for a long time, around the bedside, I do a lot of gazing at the chest X-ray with registrars. And I set a lot of store by a number of features, uh, which I think flag somebody is having TB, the miliary, the nodes, uh, nodularity, cavities, pleural effusions. These features help me a lot. And if it's interstitial, then I think, well, it's probably not TB. And so what we did in our studies, we got a radiologist who was blinded to the diagnosis to come out with these features, these, were any of these individual features present? And then we asked him to say, do you think TB is possible, unlikely or likely? So possible was probably not, but it's never impossible to have TB on a given chest X-ray. And then we looked at the odds ratio that the radiologist's call was correct, or these radiological features were correct. And the striking thing was pleural effusion and cavitation were useless. Interstitial, which I thought would be useful because it would predict pneumocystis and not so much TB, turned out not to be so useful. Look at cavitation, the odds ratio of 1.01. That's can't get less useful than that. And we found some other studies which came up with the same conclusion. And we think that the explanation for that is prior TB. So nearly half of our uh, patients had had TB before, and the cavitation that we were seeing was from the prior episode of TB. Because remember, when your CD4 count is very low, you tend not to make cavities. And most of the people who come into hospital have low CD4 counts. So seeing a cavity, which I used to think, ha ha, I've nailed it, actually not so much. Nodes, pretty good, but not as good as I thought, and not that common. Miliary is a very strong pointer to TB. Uh, but again, one doesn't see that particularly often in uh, clinical practice. When you do see it, it's a strong pointer towards TB. So the chest X-ray, individual features, not so good. The sort of overall impression of TB, putting everything together in this kind of gestalt view, very strong. So if an experienced person looks at X-ray and says, this has got the feel of TB, that's actually quite good. But to try and break it down to say which one of these specific things it is, we can't do that. Okay, so, uh, oopsie, one up. So we then went ahead and did a TB clinical prediction rule in inpatients, um, similar to the process that I showed you for the pneumocystis rule, but this is stronger, more patients, and our reference standard here was TB culture, and we cultured these people to the nth degree. They got two sputum cultures, and we cultured their blood, and we cultured anything that looked extra pulmonary as well. And then we came up with this clinical prediction rule, which where we converted the um, odds ratios into a simple point scoring system. And the first thing is that, although on univariable analysis, the WHO symptoms screen some of them looked reasonable. None of them came out on multivariable analysis, not one. Amongst the danger signs, these two danger signs actually did predict TB, but not very strongly. Uh, the TB on chest X-ray, likely five. So that's quite strong. Possible one, unlikely zero. So that's the most important thing is that the overall impression of the T of, of the X-ray is likely TB. Uh, not quite as strong as pneumocystis, but strong enough. Cough of more than 14 days is helpful. The next strongest thing is a hemoglobin. If your HB is under about eight, that's a very strong pointer to TB. Neither pneumocystis nor bacterial pneumonia are associated with anemia, but TB often is. And the white cell count, if the white cell count is elevated, then you take two points off because that means TB is now very unlikely. Now, this is obviously quite a complex score and I don't think people are going to be using it. Uh, Tom Boyles has had the idea of putting in regression using our data and others into a cell phone app and you just key in the data that you have and it spits out what the chances are of TB. That's probably the way this could be used down the line. This is just how the score 
pans out from 100% sensitive to 100% specific. And as, as with any diagnostic thing, as you get less sensitive, so you get more specific. And you can choose a place where you want to cut it off. Um, probably yeah, you want a pretty sensitive test. So if somebody scores anything more than about three, you probably want to say, well, TB is likely here. But again, this is more just for interest. This is not a pragmatic approach. I want to spend a little bit of time speaking about sputum induction. If there's one thing you could do taking away from this, get your hospital to do this. Sputum induction uses 5% saline. It's got to be driven by an ultrasonic nebulizer. 5% saline is available on EML, so all hospitals should be able to order it. The machine is cheap, it costs a couple of grand. The tubing is not that cheap because you have to throw it away after single use, you can't sterilize it properly. But as I said, between 40 and 65%, in our study, 65% of people, because they were really sick, they had to have danger signs. They're just too weak to cough and they cannot produce a sputum. And that's a big deal. When your best diagnostic test is sputum and about half of the inpatients just aren't gonna give you any, that's a problem. And instead of scratching your head and doing this and dreaming up empiric that or the other, why don't you just induce them? Sputum induction is able to obtain sputum in about 80% or more of people who can't produce it. In our study, it was approaching 90%. And the person who did our sputum induction in the study was a lay counselor who was trained somewhat by a research medical officer. And he just got induced sputum in 90% of people. It has been shown to increase the yield of expert and sputum smear and TB culture. Of course, these days it's all expert, but there's evidence to show that it increases the yield of all TB microbiology diagnosis. It's also, as I've mentioned already, useful to diagnose pneumocystis. On the downside, there's a risk of TB transmission. So at Hrutsky, we do this in a negative pressure room. At the secondary hospital where we did the research, we used to do it outside in the stoop, which works just as well. So this really makes a huge difference. Tom Boyles looked at our data and came up with this analysis, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, he was trying to find out what is the cheapest and quickest way to diagnose TB and looked at LAM. We did LAM in a subset of our patients and of the 170 odd who had TB confirmed on culture, 60 were positive on LAM. The spot sputum picked up nearly all of the LAM people. Those circles didn't quite intersect. But those who were unable to have a spot went on to do an induced sputum and the induced sputum was almost covered the entire universe. So if you can get one decent induced sputum, you, you know, you're very close to culture and the lamb's not adding much and at least the experts telling you whether it's roof resistant or not. These data that I'm showing you were with the old expert. If we had done it with expert ultra, the result would have been even better. What about abdominal ultrasound? We all go to this. X-ray is not so conclusive. Let's look at the ultrasound and that will really help us a lot. Or will it? Now, most patients with TB and a low CD4 counts have disseminated TB. If you look hard enough, if you biopsy them or do autopsies on them, you'll find disseminated TB in nearly everybody. Studies that a number of people have done, and we also looked at this um, in, in our study, showed that abdominal nodes that were decent size, splenic hypodensity, some people call them microapsises. I don't like calling them that because you don't really know that they are in fact abscesses, they're just hypodensities. And the presence of infusions are all independently associated with TB. But in a Cochrane review, which was done by Neil van Hoving as part of his PhD, um, the pool sensitivity and specificity 60 to 70%. This is not great. Lymphoma causes splenic hypodensities, for instance, and can mimic all of the features of TB. A point of care ultrasound, which Neil van Hoving did as part of his PhD, uh, was quite useful. He was doing point of care ultrasound in the emergency unit. He's an emergency physician and uh, found it to be quite useful, uh, often quicker than getting a chest X-ray in that setting. 
Roland Kristol, who, who led our hospital study, compared the yield of abdominal ultrasound and chest x-ray for TB diagnosis. The Venn diagram is a bit complicated and hard to get a handle on these. Were the ones with TB, the other ones in the outer circle didn't have TB. And you can see x-ray and ultrasound overlap. But it's simpler to look at the box. Chest x-ray is less sensitive than ultrasound was in our study, but more specific. So neither imaging modality is great, but chest x-ray is a bit more specific. Ultrasound is a bit more sensitive. And there are some people who only show up on the ultrasound and some who only show up on the chest x-ray. So it kind of makes sense to do both, but as long as you realize that imaging doesn't tell you whether there are acid fast bacilli there, it merely can suggest patterns that are compatible with the diagnosis. What about CRP and procalcitonin? CRP has actually just been added to the new WHO guidelines, uh, especially for outpatients with HIV associated TB. And uh, that was again, part of our individual participant data meta-analysis. We did this for them. And the sensitivity approached 90%, depending on which cutoff you use. And it was quite a lot more specific than the full symptom screen. So CRP's now got a place in WHO guidelines for TB diagnosis in outpatients. CRP and procalcitonin have both been used in randomized trials to decide which patients with low respiratory tract infections need antibiotics. Uh, this has been done in HIV negative population. Both of these tests you can get as point of care tests. Um, however, when it comes to differentiating between pneumonia, TB or pneumocystis in HIV positive people, there isn't really any good data on PCT and there's conflicting results on CRP. So we had a look and here are the results. Um, we excluded people who had co-infections. So in this analysis, we only looked at people with a single diagnosis of pneumonia, pneumocystis or TB. And statistically, wonderful, you've breached the 0 0.05 magical threshold of statistical significance, but you haven't really hit clinical significance. Because yes, pneumocystis CRP is lower than TB, which is lower in turn than pneumonia. Um, but the overlap is just too great. And this research was done by Mendelssohn F, that's Mark Mendelssohn's wife, Fiona, who did this as part of her, of her MPH. Uh, I'm not sure why. Oh, yeah, we are. It did come down. Okay. So she also looked at procalcitonin in the same sample, same story. PJP lowest, pneumonia highest, TB in between, nice p values, but lots of overlap. And then she did a receiver operating characteristic curve. Those of you who aren't familiar with it, if the test lies along this diagonal here, that gives you an area under the curve of 50% or 0.5, which is a totally useless diagnostic test. The best test would be one that went all the way up there and all the way across there. The ideal test would have an AUC of one. There is no ideal test for anything, so nobody ever gets to one. So you end up between 50% and one. And you can see here that all of these are quite low. Unless your area under the curve is around 80% or so, you're either talking about tests that aren't great, up to about 0.6, pretty useless. 0.6 to 0.7, little bit helpful, similarly here, but nothing great. So the ability of this rock test tells you about how good it is to discriminate one condition from another. You could just have eyeballed the graph and get the same idea that this is not going to be very helpful. So we concluded that neither test would really help us a lot at the bedside. And in our WHO meta-analysis, the sensitivity was brilliant of CRP and the specificity was terrible. What about co-infections? This is a Venn diagram here. You can see quite a lot of people with TB also had 
features of pneumonia and some of them had pneumocystis as well. Some pneumocystis patients also had features of pneumonia. So co-infections are common. So these were reference standard diagnosis for all three of them. And this is what you get. It's quite, there's a lot of overlap. When it comes to bacterial infection, now here we use the quantitative PCR. I spoke earlier about this. The cutoff of 10 to the 5 copies per ml of a particular organism has been sort of validated for pneumococcus outside of HIV, but sort of not validated for anything else. But so we decided to use this as the cutoff for all bacterial infections because there was nothing else out there and we couldn't rely on culture because um, everybody had had antibiotics first. And you can see from the table that most people or many people have bacterial infection is TB, it's 40%, pneumocystis, it's about a third. And in CAP, only about half of them were able to find a bacterial infection. Yes, significantly more than in the other two groups, but you can see bacterial co-infection at quite a heavy colonization slash infection uh, rate is very common. Okay, so when we look at our study in which we did in two secondary hospitals in Cape Town. This is what we came up with a final diagnosis. TB was in just over half. Bacterial pneumonia, similar number. Pneumocystis was quite a lot less common, but still 10%. And obviously this adds up to more than 100% because of co-infections, but together over 90% of admissions are due to one or more of these three. That's why I said in the beginning, the focus is on the big three. The others are kind of icing on the cake. In Steve Lawn's study, which was totally unselected HIV positive inpatients, uh, half of them had a cough, but a third of them overall had TB. So if you, you know, TB is really common. If you look for it, you will find it. Other com less common respiratory opportunistic infections, fungi have to be borne in mind, especially with diffuse nodular or sometimes even interstitial patterns. A very strong clue to these is whether the patient has mucocutaneous papules or ulcers. So a sick patient with a crop of skin papules, just get out your biopsy immediately and send it off for fungal culture. And while you're at it, do a cryptococcal antigen test. Now, cardia can mimic TB. I came across a study many years ago showing that nocardia was quite a common cause of things mimicking TB. And I, I went on a mission for many years looking for nocardia and found hardly any. But there is a little bit around and nocardia will cause a false positive urine lamb just for interest. Viruses, surprisingly, there's not a lot known about viral causes of opportunistic infections in HIV. We looked at a whole panel of viruses in our study and really it was quite difficult to tease out what was going on. We found a lot and there's no validated cutoff. So we kind of ended up downplaying that finding somewhat. We know, what we do know about viruses is that both influenza and COVID-19 are more severe in HIV. And the second thing that's not uncommon is that when you do a bronchoscopy in people with suspected pneumocystis, you quite often find CMV and pneumocystis. And if you treat the pneumocystis, they get better. So the CMV that you see is thought to really be a local reactivation in response to the, CM to the pneumocystis infection. Occasionally you find nothing else and CMV is thought to be the cause, but it's not common. And toxoplasmosis can also present with a pulmonary component, but normally the CNS component overwhelms the clinical picture. But if you see a little bit of shading on the x-ray, it doesn't mean that the person has TB. Uh, you have to prove that. And then, of course, there's some important non-infectious causes. I put two up here. Kaposi's sarcoma on the left, which can mimic, I guess, TB more than anything else with nodules and effusions and uh, some interstitial patterns. And lipocytic interstitial pneumonitis, which can mimic pneumocystis and sometimes also miliary TB. Uh, but these people often aren't very symptomatic and generally don't come into hospital with this problem. So we dreamt up an algorithm. Oopsie, sorry. And I'm sorry to tell the people who are antibiotic stewardship fiends 
the algorithm starts by giving somebody a broad spectrum antibiotic. That is what the WHO recommendations have been saying for a long time. That is what our data supports. And you cannot distinguish uh, the clinical features of a septic person with bacterial infection from a septic HIV positive patient uh, with TB. You just can't tease them out. So the starting point is you get your broad spectrum antibiotics. Often that will have been started at the clinic already. If the clinic have given a broad spectrum antibiotic and there hasn't been a response, you can omit that step. Then the next step is to do a rapid TB diagnostic test. Urine lamb should be done on everybody in hospital. That's current guidelines. And an expert ultra on sputum. If you can't, if the person can't cough, do an induced sputum. If that still doesn't work, if there's something extra pulmonary, do that. We've shown lymph node, bar, lymph node FNAB is a very good way to do ultra. Um, you know, pleural fluids, fair, not great, but fair. CSF, reasonable. So anything you can get your hands on extra pulmonary is, is useful. If these are positive, obviously you've got TB and that's the end of the story. If they're negative, that's when you look at the imaging, not before really. I mean, obviously you look at the imaging, because you'll get that before the expert, but you should consider it in the algorithm once you've got back at least the, the urine lab. If the chest x-ray looks like pneumocystis, the chances are very high that it is pneumocystis and you should treat that. If the chest x-ray or the ultrasound suggests TB, send off some TB cultures, especially sputum, that's our best body fluid for nailing TB and start TB therapy. But if the x-ray doesn't suggest it, have they responded to antibiotics? If yes, hooray, they had a bacterial infection and you probably aim to discharge them pretty soon. If not, then again, you're probably starting empiric TB therapy. And you generally want to see a response, usually not necessarily better, but five days or so, you should start being better. I stretched that out to seven days, but I think five days is probably enough. And if there's no response, then you need to consider these other things like fungi or nocardia, bronchoscopy should be considered. Now, obviously this whole algorithm could be derailed at step one. If somebody looks like they've got the skin rash of histoplasmosis, then you chuck the algorithm out the window. Algorithms are, need to, are there to be a tool, not to be a slave. They're supposed to be your tool. You're not supposed to be their slave. So the key points are all patients, with advanced HIV disease who are sick enough to come to hospital with a respiratory presentation should get antibiotics. And I would say parenteral broad spectrum to start with. Everyone needs a rapid test for TB. That's now in the WHO guidelines. There's none of this, if they've got this, then do it. If they haven't, don't. If you come to hospital and you're HIV in a high prevalence setting like ours, you need to do a TB test. I've spoken about the imaging, how it can help you guide. Is it empiric therapy for pneumocystis or TB? with fair accuracy, but never forget that it's only fair. If you're not getting better on antibiotics, you should be empirically treating for TB. And if nothing works, then that's when you start thinking about less common causes and doing a more extensive workup. Caution, the algorithm we've suggested is a thumb suck and it has not been validated. That's my kind of distilled opinion on, on the basis of studies that we've done, studies that others have done, and what I've been able to distill from the WHO guidelines, I think it would be better for them to tweak their guidelines along this line rather than their one, which is a little bit odd in places, but I'm not going to go through that in any great detail. So that's all I had time for. I wanted to acknowledge a few um, things. WHO Danger Science Study was funded by the WHO, of, sorry, by the NIH. The individual participant data meta-analysis was funded by WHO. Ruland Chrysal was the lead investigator of the TB inpatient study. Uh, Mark Nickel was our microbiologist. We stole him from WITS, but then Perth unfortunately stole him from us. Uh, Mark Mendelssohn was the co-PI. Andre Kingney and uh, Lele Rangako were involved in the statistical analyses for the clinical prediction rules. Asha Dana was the lead investigator for uh, the data meta-analysis 
that I showed you. There's more to come, but at the moment, I just showed you what we have. And Graham Monkeys was also involved in the WHO meta-analysis. Right, thank you very much. I will stop sharing now. Happy to take questions if there's any time for it. Great, uh, thank you so much, Gary. That is um, as, as fantastic as I advertised, which was full of effusive praise. Um, that is incredibly helpful. I mean, I, I think that all of us in the field have had the same set of dilemmas. And as you say, this kind of presentation is so common among inpatients, especially. And the, this sort of evidence-based um, uh, and, and evidence and expert-based um, uh, sort of algorithm and, and triage through the, the various options is incredibly helpful. Um, a lot of questions have come in. Uh, I'm just going to go through through some of them if, I, if we can. Um, Nilesh is asking about computer algorithms in terms of uh, chest X-rays. Would you know would machine learning help to distinguish between TB, PJP, bacterial, and any other conditions in HIV? Uh, the the short answer is yes, um, but the, there's a lot there are problems. There are a lot of computer algorithms out there now. Um, many of them are commercial, and they purport to be good for diagnosing TB and they've generally been validated only in HIV negative people. So you would have to make sure that the algorithm was validated on the right population. We um, shared our x-rays together with another cohort, um, Neil van Hofing's cohort, uh, with a group at Stanford who worked on a bank of 250,000 x-rays and they did come up with a nice algorithm which looked pretty reasonable. I didn't show you that data. I think it's got a way to go. Um, our pneumocystis diagnosis was reasonable, but not brilliant, not gold standard by any means. And I'm a little bit concerned about the rush to adopt these computer assisted algorithms without making sure they're generalizable to our population. I think the algorithms are quite good at saying the X-ray is normal. Um, so it doesn't have to be looked at or there's not or there's not much to be seen there that's really important. So I think machine learning is the way to go. Um, I just don't think we're quite there yet. And my worry is people are implementing it without, uh, I think, the right evidence. But I'm a believer. Yeah. Thanks. And I mean, that almost ties in some ways to the to the second question, which is about um, the, the, the chest X-ray findings and and how, at least with when judged by humans, maybe maybe machines will have better luck. You know, that didn't seem particularly useful in, in diagnosing TB, at least. Um, and then, uh, well, well, well oh, sorry, actually, yeah. I mean, if I could just stop you there, if you if you had the overall view, when you try to break it down into individual mm -hmm. features, which I, I thought that would be a better way of doing it, to say, is there nodule? Are there nodes? Is there this? Is there that? Doing a sort of systematic approach. When you do that, it's not so good. But when you look at the X-ray as a whole, and you say it looks like TB. That's actually not bad. <laughs> if you're experienced yeah, enough, and we had a very good radiologist. So, so it wasn't bad for TB. Um, it's, it's, it's not bad, but individual yeah. features, not so great. No, yeah, e excellent point. Um, and Rumini's asking about uh, the pleural effusion specifically on chest x-ray, but it could maybe <laughs> goes with other, other some, of, some of the other bewilderment and some of the other features too. She's saying, you know, why, why wasn't chest x-ray helpful? I mean, what were the alternative diagnoses? So what, what was this being compared okay. towards? Well, I mean, this, was an, this, was, this, this group of patients had to have a WHO danger sign, so they had to be pretty sick. The danger signs are you've got a high temperature, you've got a uh, tachycardia, you're unable to walk unaided and you've got the decreased level of consciousness. So one, any one of those puts you into a danger sign. So you're pretty sick. Like I would say the average HIV positive inpatient, about 50 to 60% of them will have one of these danger signs. And in, we did the same thing in everybody. Everyone got the same diagnostic workup, the same chest X-ray, et cetera, the same read. Um, so there was a mix of TB, bacterial pneumonia, pneumocystis, and then a rag bag of other things. So it was a real world setting, I think. Uh, a sizable effusion is worth needling. If it's lymphocytic exudate, that strongly favors TB, although lymphoma is still on the cards. If it's a polymorph exudate, then it's probably paraneumonic effusion. The ADA will be up in both. I've never been a big fan of ADA. But I think pleural effusion is a very good thing. If you see a pleural effusion, um, I used to think it was a strong pointer to TB. We'd found it wasn't such a strong pointer to TB, but I think a lot of these effusions he was picking up were quite small. 
Um, if it's big enough to tap, tap it, and then you will learn something important. So I think pleural effusions are important and they can help you. And you can do expert on it and you can look for lymphocytes. It will generally be an exudate if it's unilateral. And as I said, the ADA not so helpful to distinguish your two main causes. And then of course, KS can cause effusions quite commonly. They're often blood stained, um, but nothing's really diagnostic for KS on, on the uh, pleural effusion. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then there's a question about ESR. You mentioned CRP and Procalcitonin. and yeah, ESR in terms of TB diagnosing, uh, the comment being more than 100 diagnostic of TB, at least just what someone was told once. Um, does that still hold? Okay, okay. Um, the half-life of medical dogma is, is very long. ESR, <laughs> if, if you never did an ESR ever again in an HIV positive person, that would be a good thing. The e, uh, HIV pushes up the ESR anyway. It is true that the ESR in HIV people with TB is somewhat higher, but the median CRP in asymptomatic HIV positive people is about 60 with quite a range. So it is a useless test. So HIV pushes it up, anemia pushes it up, uh, takes ages to come down, ages to go up. It's a 19th century test. We should park it there. It's valuable maybe for lupus, but in infectious disease, I think the ESR is really just of historic interest. And in HIV, you should never do it. I came across in Mozambique, they were using it in their TB program, their official guidelines. I, I went there with MSF to do some training and visit their research sites. Um, and I was appalled that they, were, they had ESR as one of their diagnostic criteria for TB based on an expert opinion, SAMSAC. There's very good evidence that ESR is elevated in HIV. That's a well-known fact. So don't, don't bother with ESR. It's a useless test in the setting. Uh, if you know, let me just let me temper that. If you know the, CR, the ESR is say 50, and then three months later, someone's got TB symptoms and now it's 120, maybe you could say, well, okay. But if you don't know what the prior ESR was, which hopefully you wouldn't because it's a silly test to do, then it's useless. Correct. Thank you very much. I was going to say that this, it's the most reliable way to make me angry on more drones is to show me an ESR. Um, and, uh, Dr. Mtupa is asking about urine lamb positive reactions with nocardia. She says, do you know what the cause of that is? Um, no. It is because, and I'm not a microbiologist yet, yeah, but I'm sure there's some on the call. It's because nocardia and mycobacteria are not that far apart genetically, they're related. And apparently, nocardia also have lipoarabinomanan as part of their cell wall. I did not know that, but we had a false positive case presented at our, one of our medicine meetings a couple of years ago, and I learned that. It can also be positive in people with disseminated M. avium complex infection. Uh, so, nocardia is not common but it is one of the described false positives. Yeah, great, thank you very much. I think that's, that's uh, the, pretty much all the questions. I see this one that's popped up about empyema versus TB. Um, I'm not quite sure the question there, but I mean, usually empyemas are, are relatively easy to rule out you know, once, you've, once you've needled it. I mean, then, then you've got, it either looks like pus or you grow a bug or you've got biochemical features. Um, yeah, I think, well, yeah. I, th I think I think the one thing that's that my registrars don't seem to get is that if you stick a needle in and it's pus, that's an empyema. If you grow a bug, then by definition, it's also an empyema. But there are paraneumonic effusions that are at risk of going on to develop an empyema. And those are defined by glucose pH and whether they're very exudative. There's lights criteria that are used for that. So people often don't look at pH or don't send off a glucose in a paraneumonic effusion. So if you think it's a paraneumonic effusion, do those tests. And if they meet light's criteria, you should drain that effusion. So that's the one thing that I think registrars, medical registrars seem to be largely unaware of that. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, hugely appreciated uh, to give us so much of your time. Uh, um, and uh, just, I mean, my, my phone is being flooded with um, 
comments about what a fantastic and helpful lecture that was. So thank you very, very much. Hugely appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of questions from uh, people who've not been able to attend saying, you know, please could we record it? We have recorded it. We will uh, share it. Professor Martins has given us uh, his, his kind permission. So thank you very much for that. But uh, again, thanks for your time and, and we greatly appreciate it. Pleasure. Cheerio. Bye, everybody.